And there's a lesson to be learned for those on the general ed side who are start trying to broaden the success with all students who may not be designated as students with disabilities, but indeed may have the need for some, time, some type of assistive or adaptive learning opportunities. And Dr. Posney has been a very strong advocate of general education and special education working closely together and has some very special insights about uh, things like tiered intervention or RTI at the high school level. Besides, she gives a really great presentation, but I have to warn you, it's fast. And so you have to watch the screen. Um, I always say she's great. She can do an hour presentation in 30 minutes. Um, but I warn you about that. And I also want to say that, um, unfortunately, we won't be able to post the presentation itself, nor have we provided you with a printed copy. We will post instructions on the site on how to get more information about the resources um, and give you that information fairly quickly. So without further ado, I'm proud to uh, introduce Dr. Posney. I'm going to go sit in the audience because I want to see the slides too. Take care. Thank, Thank you. And please, make sure you continue eating, because there's nothing worse than sitting there knowing that you can't eat. So where I want to start is I really want to put this all in context and really share with you how when we talk about helping every child learn, we mean every single child. President Barack Obama said it very well. He said, the fact is, there are few issues that speak more directly to our long-term success as a nation than issues concerning the education we provide to our children. He couldn't have said it better. In terms of Arnie, you know, and Arnie is, is a person who absolutely is dedicated to doing what's right. When we talk about what we want to do in education, he said we're not talking about tinkering around the edges. We're talking about fundamental changes. The question that I throw out to you is, are we talking about transformation or are we talking about reform? Which is the future of education? And I hope by the time I'm finished with this, you'll know the answer to that particular question. What we need is we need growth. Growth is that thing that will help us move forward. When I think about, you know, what you need to do at the high school level, you have probably one of the most challenging jobs in terms of making sure every student is successful. Now, I often throw this out to just so you'll learn something a little about me. I lived with a high school principal for 18 years, and that was long before I got married. <clears throat> yeah, I know, um, but let me explain to you. My dad was my high school principal. So for those of you in the high school, I've been there, done that, I understand. Do you know where I saw my dad the most? It was never at home. It was when I finally went to high school, and I'd see him at the games and everything else. For those of you who are high school administrators, believe me, I understand exactly where you spend your time. And yet, I, you know, I think about him when I think about helping every child. My dad grew up in the ghettos outside of Chicago, outside here, and I know that he had to fight his way through. But when he became a principal, he understood those kids that didn't know how to make it and didn't know the importance of education. He would go to their homes, get them out of bed, and get them to school. On the day that he died, there were letters to the editor from kids that he had helped, and every single one of them said, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him. That's what makes a difference in terms of you know, how we're going to change this. We know that we have to learn new concepts. We know that we have to add to our skill base, and we have to stretch everybody's mind. That's when growth and change will really take care. We don't have time to waste. And I always like putting it into the context of kids and cartoons. And the little boy is saying, anytime you're ready, Daddy, I'll be sitting outside growing older. Well, we don't have time to let kids just get older. We have to work with them every single day. Now, do you want to be feeling guilty about this? Absolutely. When I think about, you know, some, some statements about what does it mean to have growth, um, Van Gogh said, he who moves not forward goes backward. Benjamin Franklin said, without continual growth and progress, such words as improvement, achievement, and success have no meaning. And it's the last, the Irish saying that I really like, you've got to do your own growing no matter how tall your grandfather was. When we think about working with individual kids, we have to work with every single individual child. And it doesn't make any difference what label they might have. When we think about where we need to head and what the, the, the task is in front of you, 
in terms of a paper that was written by the chief state school officers, when I was the chief state school officer in Kansas, I chaired, co-chaired this particular committee. And what we said in that paper, it said, our work begins with the promise that we have made to prepare each and every child for success in post-secondary education, work, and citizenship. This is what we promise to every single child, and we need to make sure that we transform the system. Now, when we think about what we want for the future, now think about this famous words out of Thomas Watson, who was the former chairman of IBM in 1943. He said, I think there is a world market for about five computers. I don't think he's in charge of the company anymore. Look at this one. Ken Olson, president of Digital Equipment Corporation in 1977, he said there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. And now we carry them around in our pocketbooks. It's amazing in terms of the future that we have. But this is the, the, the role that you have been put in charge of. What is your vision for people in the future? So now think about these kids that were born in 1992. And these are some of the things that we think about, the mindset. That to them, Fergie is a pop singer, not a princess. Leno and Letterman have always been trading insults on, on opposing networks. They have no idea that Johnny Carson even existed. Computers have never lacked a CD-ROM disk drive. Czechoslovakia never existed. Toothpaste tubes have always stood up on their caps. Rock bands have always played at presidential inaugural parties. And Beethoven has always been a good name for a dog. Think about it. What you're working on now is you're working on the kids for the next, the, the next 18 years. And think about the kids who are being born today into the world as we think about it. You know, I, I was chatting with people at my table, and my mother is 89 years old. To her, a computer is still something she can't fathom. And you think about the kids. My son has no idea what the world is like without a computer. And, and he's an engineer. He went to college not with a pen and paper. He went to college with a computer. He's an engineer, and to him, he would never thought about taking notes with a, a pen and a piece of paper. When we think about these millennials and the kids who are coming up in the future, they use their computer or a digital device at least almost 11 hours a day, if not more. I can be sitting in the same room with my son, and we could not talk for three hours, and yet I will have communicated with him. It's amazing. They are multitaskers. They are so good at playing music, working on a digital device, watching this. You know, it's amazing what they can do. Hyper communicators. You know how we always used to kid about the fact that I'd ask my son when he came home from school, how was your day? And what was his answer would be? Fine. Now I communicate with him so many times during the day, it's, it's amazing. But it's really been helpful. They are gamers. They are one of the most highly educated group of people we've ever had. They are very socially and civically conscious, and they are highly optimistic about the future. Think about the kids that we are preparing for the future, and think of where they're coming from already. Now, when you take a look at this, and look at where they spend their time when they are on the computer, these 8- to 18-year-olds spend their time working on various activities. The greatest amount of time, 25%, is spent on social networking. Think about all that time where they are communicating with other people. 19% of their time is playing games. What I find really interesting is look at the percent of time they spend sending emails. Only 6% of their time. They are now texting more than they are doing anything else. How, many, how much of the assignments that you give kids, how much of that is done on the computer? For them, that should be their mode of communication and the way they do their homework. Very, very different. We also know, in terms of our outcomes across the, the country, that we have been slipping in terms of how well we do in comparison to the rest of the world. In terms of the PISA, the, the international assessment, in math, we're now 25th out of 30 OECD countries. In science, we're 21st. We were first in the nation just five to six years ago. And think about the fact that we lose one-fourth of our kids who never graduate from high school at all. One-fourth of that, one out of every four kids. That is amazing in the country today that we have that many kids who can't even finish what we refer to as a, a diploma. The other thing that we know, and, and you know, several of the speakers this morning talked about the importance of literacy. Absolutely. The gateway to any content is reading, and kids have to be literate. When we take a look at it, and this was done by uh, Will Daggert, and he has done this over and over again, when we talk about the level of reading ability that kids have to have, we're talking about having the highest level they've ever had before. 
if you take a look at it, and I know it's somewhat difficult to see, but if for their own personal use, you look at a Lexile score, kids have to have a Lexile score in order to read a health insurance form of a little over 1,300, 1,360 in terms of the score. That's just to read an insurance form, something we all have to fill out over and over again. But if you talk about entry-level careers, they have to have a Lexile score of 1,385 if they even want to begin to tackle finance. And look at our common classroom materials and the Lexile score that's at grades 11 and 12. Those scores range from 1,100 to 1,300, not even at the level the kids are going to need in order to be successful. We have to have kids more literate and understand more of the words that we use better than ever before or they are not going to be successful. We also know that when we've talked to employers, they estimate that 45% of high school graduates are not adequately prepared for the skills that they need to go beyond an entry-level job. We also know that college instructors estimate that over 42% of high school graduates are not adequately prepared for their high school education and for the expectations in college classes. There is a disconnect, and this is one of the reasons the, the Common Core has been focused on making sure that kids are college ready. And we're talking about every child being college college ready. President Barack Obama has made his goal for the future very, very clear. By 2020, America will once again have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. That is what we need to have. Most of the jobs that are required in this country from here on in require some level of post-secondary education, and a great majority of them require a college education. We cannot fail to prepare our kids for that future. Now, this is one, and I always shared this with Arnie as well, because I really think this is what we want. Max is beginning his quest for the MBA. What you are doing is you are setting Mac up to be, uh, Max up to be as successful as he possibly can. He, we don't know whether he's going to make it, but we want him to be able to have the ability to try. That's what it is that you do every day to help. For, uh, when President Obama spoke in March of 2009, he put a call to action out for all of us. And he said, I'm calling on our nation's governors and state education chiefs to develop standards and assessment that really just don't measure whether students can fill in a bubble on a test, but whether they really and truly possess the 21st century skills like problem solving, like critical thinking, entrepreneurship, and creativity. What you have to teach nowadays goes far beyond what we refer to as just the basics. Kids need to know the basics, but they need to be able to use that information. How can they analyze what it is? How can they use that piece of information to solve the next problem? So I know you've gone over and, and you've seen the, the blueprint in terms of the, the six core areas that are in under the ESEA reauthorization. We talk about college and career-ready students, so we have the highest level of standards we've ever had. And in order to do that, we must have the best teachers and the best leaders we've ever had. We also have to think about all of our different kids with whom you work with, whether it's kids with disabilities, whether it's EL, um, English learners, um, whether it's kids in poverty, it doesn't make any difference. We have to meet the needs of every single child. We also have to go beyond just reading and math. We know that technology skills are critically important. We know that PE, uh, physical education is important, career and tech ed. When we talk about a complete education, we are now talking about the whole continuum of, of what's needed. We also know that we need to make sure that kids are safe and as healthy as they can possibly be. And we need to look to you to see what are the innovative ideas that you have that can work. We listened to two principals this morning in terms of how they turned their schools around, what great ideas they came up with, and we know that we can turn to you to make sure we can find out what it is. When we think about the first one, having kids, college and career ready, one of the markers that we take a look at is how well are the kids reading by the time they're in third grade. Now, this is a pretty typical class where one-third of the kids in third grade, when they were giving a reading assessment, one-third of them scored, scored at the low level. They were not proficient, and they were below basic. Another third of them scored at the medium level. They weren't proficient, but at least they were at the basic level. And another third of the kids were highly proficient and could read very well. Now, when you take a look at that group, what happened? to them in terms of graduation, it, knowing that this is their reading level at that point in time. Take a look at what happened. Those one-third of the kids who scored low and not proficient and not even at the basic level, two-thirds of them, two-thirds of them did not graduate high school. Two-thirds of that particular group. In terms of the medium not proficient, 25% of them. 
and 12% of the highly proficient. This makes an incredible difference when we know whether kids can read or not read. Another indicator and another marker in terms of, of why literacy is so incredibly important. We have kids that are raised in different types of families. We've got the first child who's being raised in a family known as a professionals. Both parents tend to be college educated. Both of them tend to have jobs. A child who is being raised in that family hears over the course of an hour a little over 2,100 words. They also hear about 32 affirmatives saying, nice job, I like the way you colored that. And they hear about five prohibitions, like no, don't touch that wall socket. Then we've got the next child who's being raised in what's known as a working class family. Both parents tend to have a high school diploma. Both parents tend to have a couple of different jobs just to help ends, make ends meet. A child who's being raised in that family hears almost half the number of words of a child who's being raised in a professional level family, a little over 1,200. That child also hears about 12 affirmatives and about seven prohibitions. And then let's take a look at a child who's being raised in poverty. Tends to be a single family home. They often live on welfare. A child who is being raised in that home hears about one-third the number of words as a child who is being raised in a professional family. And that child hears twice as many prohibitions as affirmatives. Now why is that important? Children cannot learn to read words they have never heard. Kids who come to kindergarten at that age already that far behind, it's incredibly difficult for us to close the gap. Language is so important from, the, from birth on and how critically important it is that we develop that language because otherwise it makes it so much more difficult and especially by the time they get to high school. The one thing we know about kids is kids do not drop out overnight. They drop out over the course of time. I can tell you in fourth and fifth grade, the kids who are going to be probably the future dropouts. Those kids who are not reading by the time they need to access that content in other subject areas. Those kids begin to drop out because they know by the time they're in middle school, they are not accessing the same level of content as other kids. And you guys know better than I do that once they get into high school and they are no longer on track and, and earning their credits, they're going to drop out because they're not going to be able to graduate with their class. These are the kids that we have to catch, and we have to do whatever it takes in order to turn this around. One of the things that we have promoted, and the, the reason I'm speaking to you, is the, the fact is, is that we in special education probably work with the kids who probably have the most difficulty learning. If I want to tell you secrets about how to help kids learn, talk to your special education teachers. We work with anything and everything in, tr in terms of helping them. And I truly believe that a lot of what we put in IDEA is, belongs in ESEA. One of them is early intervening services. What early intervening services does is it provides services for kids in kindergarten through grade 12. I want you to understand that, who have not yet been identified as in need of special education, but who need additional academic and behavioral support to succeed. Do you know that up to 15% of the federal IDEA dollars can be used to provide these EIS services, and it can be used in high school as well? Now, you may have to wrestle it out of the special educator's hands, but it was with that intent in mind. We know, and I'll, I'll be the first one to say it, we over-identify too many kids as being in need of special ed when they really are not. They look like they're disabled because by the time they have failed, they look like they're learning disabled. And I honestly believe we label over 50% of our kids as LD when they're really not. It's because they can't read. And this is why EIS is in there. This is going to help us make sure that kids are college and career ready. We also know that when we think about working with the diverse learners and, and so forth, that all students, including students with disabilities, must be challenged to excel within the general curriculum. They must be prepared for success in their post-school lives. And it has to include college, careers, or both. This was put in the draft Common Core State Standards. And I was very proud to be a chief state school officer at that time and to know that we really and honestly believe that all kids can learn, just like everyone else. These are the views on schools from kids, and what they wanted to know is they, they asked the kids, and these were high school kids that they asked, and they said, is what you're getting right now preparing you for further education? If you take a look at it in terms of how well, the kids responded, 24% of the kids said it was excellent, that they got an excellent preparation. The next one is they said about 32% said it was good, and another 24% thought it was fair. In terms of preparing you for the workforce, it was probably even less. When we think about an excellent preparation for the career, 
and uh, the workforce, only 15% said it was excellent, and 30% of them said it was good. So they are taking a look at it and saying, maybe I'm not as well prepared as I thought it was. And I think it gives, gives us some information upon which we might, what, might want to work. So when we think about what those excellent teachers and excellent leaders have to have, we have to offer what's known as UDL, Universal Design for Learning. What does Universal Design for Learning do? It means we teach them in multiple ways that if kids tend to be auditory learners or visual learners or they happen to be a hands-on type person, that we offer all of that to them, that we don't just stand up there and just talk to them because some kids don't learn that way. And the reverse is, do we allow the kids to show us what they know in multiple ways? Maybe giving a speech isn't what some child does, or maybe writing an essay may not be it. So do we allow that child to do a project instead that allows us to see what they know and not going back and saying that everybody has to do it the same way. We're talking about individualizing learner to their strengths and building on those areas that need to be built on. And we need to make sure that we're flexible with what we do, and UDL will make that happen. Another one, when we, think, when we talk about it, there was an activity where I asked a group of kids, what I asked them to do was to um, write a story and to illustrate their story for me. This was Amy, and you can see that Amy knew how to write her name that is in there, and for her, every other one of those letters stands for a word, and she wrote a story about a farm and barn, and that's what she illustrated on this particular story. Then we had Juan. And Juan, and you can understand as you take a look at what Juan did, he understands that words go from left to right. And he illustrated his story just about as well as I do. This is about how I draw. But this was a story about his brother. And then we have Andrew. And Andrew uh, wrote, once upon a time there was a princess. One day she got lost in the woods. What do we know about Andrew? He has a great sense of story. He knows that there's a beginning, a middle, and he's working on towards the end. And then we have Alec, the last one. And he said, Dear Dad, Dad, Dear Dad and Mom, I'm learning about compound sentences, and I have $4.65, and I really like you guys a lot. Now, this one always makes me smile, because this one just so happens to be, have been written by my son. Now, when you take a look at these, there is something exactly the same about all four of these kids. Do you have any idea what it is? All four of these kids are exactly the same age. And what we want is we want every child to be where my son was. They're all six years old at this particular point in time. Are any, do any of these kids have a disability? Are any of them English language learners? Do any of them, are any of them disadvantaged? Are any of them disenfranchised or disengaged? And does it make any difference? The label makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. We need to provide the support and interventions for any child no matter what. If I had my way, I'd get rid of labels altogether. Just, and what we need to do is we need to provide what any child needs whenever he or she needs it and when we know that they're struggling. This is what you're trying to do within your school system. And this is what we're trying to do at the, the federal level, to give you those supports that allow you to be as successful as we know. What we know is that there is a greater tragedy than being labeled as a slow learner, and that's being treated as one. For far too long, kids who lived in poverty, kids who had disabilities and so forth, we felt sorry for them, and we didn't expect them to do anything at all. That's no longer an excuse for us. Kids can do so well. Look at the results from the two schools this morning in terms of the progress that has been made, even with kids with disabilities and everything else. We know that response to intervention, something else that's in IDEA and I want to see it in ESEA, response to intervention is a way of screening kids early on to help identify those kids who may be at risk. And we can do this on a school-wide basis so that we can provide that intensive support and monitor their progress in every single classroom. This is what we need to put into place in every single high school in this country. This is what makes a difference. You heard eloquently this morning about how monitoring progress is absolutely essential for every individual child. You cannot do this if you don't know where every child is every time you teach. We also know that kids need to feel safe and healthy. And I particularly like this one. It's a fairly new teacher who talks to her principal and said, can you help me, Mrs. Martin? This wasn't covered in any of my education courses. We know that kids have to feel comfortable. My very first teaching job was teaching um, emotionally disturbed middle school kids. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I think all middle school kids are emotionally disturbed. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I also think it prepared me very well for what I, a lot of people I work with today, but the one thing, yeah, yeah. 
I need to be very careful. Now, the one thing I learned early on, though, is that before I could teach any of those kids any content, anything academically, I had to establish a relationship and get their trust. I had to work on the social-emotional side far, far before I could get anything else across to them. We can never forget that side of the kids. Yes, we do need to stress the academics, but don't ever forget the social and affective side. So many kids come to school um, you know, not having had a good relationships and knowing how to get along with other people. We need to make sure that we have what's known as positive behavioral interventions and supports. This is where we provide on a systemic basis as well as on an individualized basis those strategies that help kids achieve social and learning outcomes at the same time. We cannot leave PBIS off the table. We have to have that as part of the equation. And what I want to share with you, and, and I know that I have some of my friends from uh, Kansas who are here, where I most recently came from, what I want to share with you is the system that we put in place in Kansas. We refer to it as the multi-tier system of supports. What you're going to see in this particular thing is RTI, the academic side of it, is very, very important when we think about this tiered level of education. We didn't forget about the social and affective side. PBIS is the other side of the equation. And undergirding all of this is UDL and early intervening services. It's when you put all four of these things into place that it makes a difference. And I want to share with you, when I, I was in Washington, D.C., and that's when I then went back to Kansas to become the Commissioner of Education. When we came back, the first thing we put on was what we refer to as an RTI forum or an MTSS forum. What we were hoping for is that we'd get a couple hundred people who would attend the forum from across the state and they would bring uh, teams with them. Well, we had to cut off registration at 800 and we had a waiting list of 800 more. The, the, the field just embraced what it was that we were trying to do. And I want to share with you some of the results of what happened. And I want to share Junction City, Kansas with you. And there's a, a reason why I'm sharing Junction City. One, it's the 10th largest district in the state. Um, but it's a military base, Fort Riley, where the Big Red is housed in uh, Junction City. And you'll see that it's a very diverse population. Has almost 40% kids on free and reduced price lunch. And of course, um, almost half of the kids are connected to the military. But there's something else that goes on in terms of Junction City. One is the mobility rate. Think about this. They don't have the same kids year to year. They often have 10 kids moving in and out almost every single day. When you talk about the long-term life of kids, they're lucky if they have the same kids two years in a row. The other thing is, is that they're working with kids who may have one or both of their parents over in Iraq or Afghanistan, and they don't know if their parents are going to come back alive. Think about what they deal with every single day. They have some real struggles. What I want to share with you is the fact that they put MTSS into place in 2003. And five years later, I want to share with you the kind of results that they came up with. Now, this is math. Okay, and I know it's somewhat hard to read. But in 2003, the special education, it looks like the little pink bar on the left, there were approximately 8% of kids with disabilities who were at the proficient level or above in terms of math. Five years later, in 2008, it was at 68%, an actual 60% increase. And know that these were not even the same kids that they had in, in 2003. Phenomenal results for almost every single subgroup that they had. But there's something else I want to point out to you in terms of where these results are from. This is not Junction City Elementary School, and it's not Junction City Middle School. This is Junction City High School. This can happen when there is a concerted and systemic effort that is put into place. Now, this is math. I want to share with you in terms of reading. The exact same thing happened in reading. It's amazing what can be done when you put your mind to it and you really want to make a change. MTSS made all the difference in the world in terms of Junction City. Another one I want to share with you is Hillsboro. Hillsboro is uh, one of the smaller towns. It has a, a, a student population of about 560 kids. In 2003, Hillsboro found 28 students to be eligible for special ed services. They put MTSS into place, and in 2008, they found one student to be eligible for special ed. Now know that this also cost them money. Okay, the state funding formula in Kansas rewards you for identifying more kids with special education needs. That's true for a lot of the states. 
And they, even though they knew they would lose the special education state funding because of that, they did the right thing. The amount of students with disabilities that are being identified in Kansas over the last five years has gone down by almost 2,000 kids. That was not something I ever thought that we would see, but this has made all the difference in the world. But the, the issue I want to share with you is we need the same level of resources, though. We cannot take the money away. That's the money that made a difference. The RTI, the EIS, all of that made the difference in terms of working with the kids. What we know is that we have not yet accomplished our mission. I've often said, I've been a local special ed director, state director, and all the rest. If my job would go away, I'd be thrilled, but I'm afraid that's not going to happen. But what we know is we need to continue to work on this, and we're looking to you to help us figure out what might work and what we need to work on. We also know, yeah, I really love this one. This one is the fact we can't work alone. We have to work together. You know, and, and if you don't have special ed at the table with you, what I'm telling you is have them at the table with you. They have money, and they hopefully they do have money. They have more discretion than you know. And, and know that they might have some good ideas. But that's why working together makes all the difference in the world. Because what we want for all students is that we want all students to acquire the same essential knowledge and skills. We want to monitor all students' learning, and we want to give them multiple opportunities and multiple ways to help demonstrate their learning for us, that all students will promptly receive the extra time and support whenever they experience difficulty in learning. And yes, we're going to let them in on the secrets. Teachers are going to clarify the standards that they're going to use to assess the quality of their work. And it's the last one that I think speaks volumes. All students will be the beneficiaries of educators who have promised to work together collaboratively to use the practices that really and truly have a positive impact on their achievement. You know, it's, it's always other people who say wonderful things when we think about what's so important to kids. This is Christina. Um, the little girl who was shot in Tucson. When President Barack Obama went uh, to the memorial service, this is what he said, and this is why it's so important in terms of what we do. He said, I want us to live up to her expectations. I want our democracy to be as good as Christina imagined it. All of us. We should do everything we can to make sure this country lives up to our children's expectations. This is why we're in education. This is why we do what we do every single day. Because what we want to do is that we want to make sure that we have helped every 20th child in this nation who drops out of school, every 10th child who has multiple risk factors, every 8th child who is mentally or physically challenged, every 7th child in this country who is Hispanic, every sixth child who is black, and every fifth child who is poor. Think about that. One out of every five kids in this country lives in poverty. But the one promise we want to make is that we can help every single child. So with that, I just want to say thank you. You guys have been a great audience, and I don't know if we have time for questions or not. <laughs> thank you. I'm sure they suffer from what I suffered from the first couple of times I saw you present, which is being almost speechless at, uh, at all the information that's being shared. So thank you very much, Dr. Posny. It was great. Um, so we're pretty much on schedule. We're about two minutes off. Uh, but I wanted to uh, share a few things with you because this is the last time we'll be seeing you in the large room in a plenary session for the remainder of the day. So I wanted to very briefly uh, review with you what's going to happen for the rest of the day and first thing tomorrow morning. So we'll be uh, going on a break in a few minutes. Um, from 1.30 to 3, we'll be op uh, looking at sessions that focus on optimizing teaching and learning. And then at around 3, there'll be a break, and we can. I think what we'll do, we'll slide by five minutes so that we'll have a break instead of at 1.30 at 1.35, uh, I'm sorry, we'll start at 1.35, uh, let's see, we'll start the sessions at, at 1.35 and end them at 3.05, and then we'll have a break, and then um, another break, and then there'll be the opportunity for, for everyone to, to uh, go into district, state, and stakeholder meetings. In the card that you received uh, when you registered, which had all of your assigned uh, breakout sessions, on the back are a list of in light blue are a list of state and 
And it's where you registered from, basically. You may not be part of the team, but wherever you're housed, uh, you would attend the session that involves the state in which you reside or in the state in which you do your work. So the sessions are all on the back of the page. You have the opportunity between 3.15 and, or 3.20 now and 4.35 to continue the conversation, to continue networking, to continue processing this great amount of information that we've been sharing with you th this morning and, and uh, again this afternoon. Then from 4.35 to 6, we're going to have what we call a meet and greet and resources reception. And that's going to be out in the outer foyer right outside the room. You'll have an opportunity to talk with representatives from some of the resource centers that are featured in the, uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, and others and, and look at some of the resources that might be of interest to you um, from those various centers. Um, in fact, Linda Miller would like to meet right at, during, at, as soon as this session adjourns with the presenters who will be sharing information during the resource, uh, the resource reception. Then you're done for the day. You have a list of, of uh, restaurants, if you still have room for food, uh, that are local to Rosemont or the hotel itself, because we will not be providing uh, a dinner. And then tomorrow morning, we'll be reconvening uh, for breakfast, continental breakfast like today, 7.30 to 8.30, we'll be starting up in this room at 8.30. We have a couple informal sessions planned for tomorrow morning for those that wish to take Wish, uh, you know, that wish to take advantage of them. They are totally voluntary, so you can't file a grievance. Um, but, uh, and one of them will involve Carlos McCauley and a couple of folks from the Department of Ed to answer questions about, that you might have about compliance. We have a, a, new, a new guest with us today, John Wright, uh, John White, excuse me, um, who is with the rural office, or I don't know the exact title, I apologize, but he would like to talk with uh, high schools that are, and states and districts that are, uh, house rural SIG awardees about some of the challenges and issues at the, at the rural level. We'll have a room assigned for him tomorrow morning, so stop by the registration desk to find out that room. The other Department of Ed, and I think the Chicago Public School folks will be meeting as well, will be in the Louvre room, uh, room across the, the foyer. In this room, which will be open at 7.30, or actually will be open at 7 o'clock if you want to get an early start on some of your conversations, we're going to put some table tags on the various tables to kind of divide the room up into role alike. So we'll have a section for state folks, a section for district folks, and a, f a section for school level folks to give you an opportunity to meet some new folks to start to continue the informal networking that we think is critical, um, not only for this meeting, but as we move forward with other kinds of professional learning community activities after the meeting. So. Again, it's the same type of presentations this afternoon. We'll continue into the state meetings and to a reception, and then we'll meet again formally starting at 8.30. We're going to give you an extra 15 minutes tomorrow morning to sleep in. Um, so we'll start here at 8.30 formally and look forward to seeing you then. Have any questions, concerns, whatever, please see a person with a red staff ribbon on. Otherwise, um, we'll look forward to uh, hors d'oeuvres and a cash bar and some informal conversation during the uh, informal meet and greet session. Thank you very much.